Hello and welcome to part five of Introduction to Sociology. Of the first of three problems we're going to take up next, rationalism and empiricism. Let me summarize though, where, how we got into where we are now. We started with a general account of philosophy, which turns out to be also an historical account. Philosophy is a discipline, and not all are like this, in which you really can't do philosophy unless you know the history of philosophy. It's not just something one can, can make up out of thin air. It's not just any dormitory bull session. One needs to know what have been the moves that uh, philosophers have made in the past, uh, have they worked or have they not, and where uh, do we go uh, from there as we carry on. And um, I made a distinction, again, it's not a conventional distinction, between P1 and P2, P1 philosophy and sense one, that is the Western tradition of rational inquiry as such. This starts with the Greeks, with Thales uh, and Ionian nature philosophy in particular, and continues to this day in all the various disciplines that go on in academic life. Philosophy since P2 though, and that's the more relevant one for us, is that, uh, special, that one specialized academic discipline which deals with problems in one or more of three areas. Those are uh, sorry, uh, metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology. And we just now finished going through each one of those three in turn. Which then brings us to a series of three philosophical problems uh, that I want us to talk through. And the reason for this is once we finish these problems, then we're going to go on to do some readings. We're going to read some primary texts, starting with the pre-Socratics. But I would like you to have, uh, in order to do this reading, some ammunition, uh, something under your belt um, that will equip you to do better uh, with the reading. So here are our three problems. I just went through them briefly, and then we'll take the first one today. Rationalism versus empiricism. And the question there is, where do we get our knowledge? And the classical answers to this, but we get our knowledge through reason or we get our knowledge through experience. And of course there is the synthetic view, we get our knowledge through both. Secondly, there's the question of analytic versus synthetic propositions. Um, of any proposition that happens to be true, and not all of them are, but of any proposition which happens to be true, is it true because it must be true or is it true merely because it just so happens to be true? Another way of putting the question is, of any proposition, can we deny its truth without contradicting ourselves or not? Turns out we can deny certain sorts, but there are others we cannot. And that's a very interesting distinction and very consequential uh, for human thought. And the last question then we're going to get into is certainty versus error reduction. What this question is really about is what's knowledge for? What is the goal of our knowledge? Do we need to look for certainty, settle for nothing less than certainty, or can we um, rightly, uh, sensibly settle for something uh, that's uh, less than 100% certain? So we'll start today then with the first problem, rationalism versus empiricism. And we'll start there with what's called Hume's fork. Hmm? Now I mentioned the notion of analytic and synthetic propositions, which I won't define here, uh, I will uh, when we come to the second problem. But Hume basically says there are two possible ways we can have knowledge. One of them is that we can have relations of ideas. Think about mathematics, think about logic. So one plus one equals blank. And the other way you can fill that in is two. Um, this is not something that depends on experience. This is something that's prior to experience. So. The, no, no, I, no amount of counting blocks, you know, one, one of the ways of teaching uh, elementary mathematics to, to children is to have them, you know, add things, add objects up and say, oh, so here's one, here's one, I make two. Right. But you have to have that idea first in order for that to make sense. You don't, uh, you don't induce that idea from the experience of, oh, there's one goes, okay, oh, 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 no. Relations of ideas, uh, things we find in mathematics or logic, um, these are prior to experience. The other kind of knowledge we can have, says Hume, is about matters of fact. And this does uh, owe to experience. Um, this comes after the fact of having experience. And once we have experience of facts, we can decide whether uh, those, whether propositions about them are true or false. So basically we have a fork in the road, Hume's fork. Uh, we can go with uh, relations of ideas, the rational sources of our knowledge, or we can go with matters of fact, the empirical sources of our knowledge. Of course, we could do both. We'll see down the road, um, just kind of to, you know, don't have to get there just yet, um, 
Hume says there are only two kinds of knowledge we can have. Immanuel Kant reads Hume and he says, no, Hume's wrong. There's a third kind of knowledge. One more of these boxes could be filled in, but we won't go there just yet. Consider some audacious attempts to gain knowledge by relations of ideas, not uh, matters of fact, first of all. Zeno. Zeno's paradoxes, uh, famous for this in antiquity, not all of them survive. And uh, as we'll see with the pre-Socratics, the ones that do survive do not survive in any direct writings of Zeno. They're quoted by others, uh, mainly Aristotle. Um, but first of all, let's look at what a paradox is. A paradox is, and this is just the Oxford English Dictionary statement uh, definition. Um, a paradox is a statement that whether true or not seems absurd at first hearing. Now, seems absurd. Does that mean it's false? Not necessarily. Because one of the things we discover by encountering paradoxes is, is that some of the things we may have taken for granted might be wrong. So the absurdity comes not from the falsity of the proposition in question, but from the uh, incorrectness of assumptions that we've made hitherto, and which will need to be adjusted in light of what we may learn. So paradoxes are not necessarily false. They just seem absurd. Hmm? Maybe this is a problem with the paradox. Maybe though it's a problem with our common sense and the prior beliefs. Okay, here's one, one paradox, famous paradox of Zeno. The paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. If the tortoise begins a race ahead of Achilles, and who was Achilles? Well, he was a great culture hero of the Greeks, fastest, strongest guy. Everybody in Zeno's audience is gonna know who he's talking about here. It goes you know, back to the Homeric literature. If a tortoise begins a race ahead of Achilles, by the time Achilles reaches the point where the tortoise was, the tortoise, however, Pokey, will be farther ahead. Again, when Achilles reaches the point where the tortoise was, the tortoise will be still farther ahead, though the distance between them is forever closing. But since the distance is forever closing, Achilles can never overtake the tortoise. QED. Hmm? Right. And isn't that the way races work? See, see how this works here. Let's set up point A, point B, point C, point D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we'll give the tortoise a handicap. We'll give him, start him off at point B, which is ahead of Achilles, who's starting behind at point A. Okay, the race is off, boom. Now, is Achilles gonna get to point A? Yes, but will the tortoise be there? No, the tortoise is moving slower than Achilles, but the tortoise is no longer at point B, he's at point C. Okay, well, can Achilles get to point C? Yes, he can, but is the tortoise going to be there? No, he's gonna to get to point D. Now, point D is a little closer, to, to C than C was to D, to B, sorry, um, but there's still a distance. Okay, and is Achilles going to get to point D? Yes, but the tortoise is not going to be there, so he's going to go. So Zeno's point seems to be as long as you give the slowest runner in a race, even a very slow runner, even a slight handicap, first of all, the fastest runner will never catch up with the slowest runner. Secondly, the fastest runner will never pass the slowest runner and win the race. The slowest runner will always win the race. So let's say we've got a race course here, and here's here's Achilles and here's the tortoise. So boom, it's off. Achilles is going to get to where the tortoise was, but the tortoise is not there. And he's going to get to where the tortoise was, but the tortoise is not there. It's going to get to where the tortoise was, and the tortoise is not there. And on and on and on. And the distance between them is going to be shrinking, but the Achilles will never get to where that tortoise is and never pass that tortoise across the finish line first. But, 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 he's a faster runner. Yeah, okay, so Zeno's willing to accommodate this. Um, give Achilles any speed you want, still gonna work. Well, you know, they've got a short distance to race. Okay, give them a long distance, doesn't matter. The point's the same, no matter how many points there are between the start line and the finish line, every time the tortoise gets to a point, oh, sorry, every time Achilles gets to a point where the tortoise was, it's where the tortoise was, not where the tortoise is. Hmm? Let's take another example of, of trying to establish something by relations of ideas. And we've seen this before, if you've, if you've uh, followed the, uh, the, some of the big guys, some of the big ideas, the supplementary lecture, which I mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, you've heard about St. Anselm by now. St. Anselm has this argument for the existence of God, which starts by saying, let's take a definition. God is that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. And if you agree that that's a good definition, follow it out. Anything which exists is greater than anything which does not exist. So if I say, yes, and Anselm, I agree with you. God is indeed that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. And incidentally, by the way, God does not exist. Well, you've just contradicted yourself. You've just said, I believe in circles, but circles are square. No, can't, can't have that. If God is indeed what that definition says that he is, and one of the properties that he must have 
its existence. Not only does he exist, not only does he have the property of exist, existence, he has that property because he must have that property. He must exist. He cannot not exist QED. Okay. And this is, of course, the famous ontological argument for the existence of God. Now, let's compare Zeno and St. Ansel. Well, it's kind of apples and oranges, isn't it? I mean, Zeno, Zeno's not talking about God. He's not a saint. He's talking about races and tortoises and Achilles. Yes, right. But what they're trying to do is establish two different conclusions, but they're using the same method, different subject matters, same method. What Zeno tries to establish for motion, St. Anselm tries to establish for God. And notice when Zeno thinks about racing, he's just thinking about the idea of racing. He says, let's think about a race between Achilles and the tortoise, come to some conclusions. He might have, instead of going out and run a race, or he might've said to himself, let me see what happened the last time I ran a race how likely is it that the tortoise is going to do, uh, is, is going to outperform Achilles in every single circumstance and, and come up with perhaps a different conclusion? So Anselm, like Zeno, too, simply sits in his armchair. Anselm thinks about a different idea, the idea of God, but then he draws some uh, powerful conclusions from that, simply by thinking about relations of ideas. Now, Suppose you wanted to prove the existence of God instead of the way St. Anselm does it. You wanted to prove the existence of God by dealing not with uh, relations of ideas, but with matters of fact, okay? So in this case, uh, with respect to St. Anselm, whereas with respect to uh, St. Anselm, Zeno had the uh, same method, different subject. Now we're talking about having a different method, same subject. Okay, so you want to argue for God, but you want to do so by the method of matters of fact rather than relations of ideas. And of course, other people who do this, uh, notably uh, Archdeacon William Paley toward the end of the 18th century. St. Thomas Aquinas had done the same thing earlier, uh, but Paley's a, perhaps a little, little um, uh, uh, more concise uh, and, and easier to state. Um, different methods, same subject matter. Let's see how this works. There's a, a good video, uh, BBC 4, uh, with Gillian Anderson from the X-Files. Let's see what she has to say. In Natural Theology, a book that Charles Darwin studied as a young man, the theologian William Paley pointed out that if he found a watch on a heap, you'd naturally assume it had a designer. The human eye was like a sophisticated piece of machinery. So just as you'd know any watch must have had a designer, so Paley argued you ought to recognize that the human eye, a brilliant piece of biological machinery, must have had one too. It was clearly the supremely intelligent eye designer known as God. Not just eyes, but human beings and every organism must also have been designed by God. Even before Paley published, the philosopher David Hume had shown that this sort of design argument didn't prove the existence of God as traditionally understood. To say that any designer of a human being must be all powerful, all knowing and benevolent goes far beyond the available evidence. At best, the argument suggests that there was some kind of designer, but it's hard to conclude much more. After Darwin's On the Origin of a Species though, Paley's style of explanation became even harder to defend. There was no longer any need to bring in a divine watchmaker, or even a mortal one for that matter, to explain what looked like highly intelligent design. The best explanation turned out to be that an impersonal process of natural selection had done all the work. Now, Harvard's famous finches. Hmm. So St. Anselm has the ontological argument for the existence of God, the argument from being, and Paley has one of the cosmological arguments for the existence of God, the argument from the cosmos and the universe. A watch implies a watchmaker, a universe implies a universe maker, therefore God exists, that's Paley's argument. So here we see uh, what St. Anselm tries to do by relations of ideas, Paley tries to do by matters of fact. Uh, again, different method, but same subject matter. So if we look at the difference between Anselm and Paley, we get at the heart of this issue about rationalism versus empiricism. Um, so Anselm is simply arguing from relations of ideas, that's a rationalist approach, tries to reach the identical conclusion that Archdeacon Paley uh, attempts to reach arguing from matters of fact, that is an empiricist approach. So 
Rationalism versus empiricism. What is the source of our knowledge? That's the question. Hmm? We'll start with rationalism first. The core insight of rationalism is that our senses deceive us. Therefore, we need to mistrust the senses. They're not a reliable source of information at all. Plato is the first poster boy for rationalism. And Plato tells the story of the cave. Um, if you don't know the story in the Republic, there are a bunch of guys, they have come up in a cave uh, their entire lives. And all they've seen is shadows. There's turns out there's a fire behind them in the cave. They're, they're chained to the wall of the cave. There's a fire behind them. And the janitors like to play tricks on them. So they, uh, they move objects between the fire and the cave wall, simulating uh, shadows. So for example, you know, like you do this with a, with a bird on the wall, uh, they have all kinds of little props like that. And this is all these guys know. Well, one day, one of the guys breaks his chains and sneaks out of the cave. And what do you think happens? Well, first of all, he's blinded by the light. You know how it is when someone turns on a light switch. Uh, my father used to do this to wake us up, my brother and myself in the morning. I hated it. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable, eh, not painful, but you know, it's eh, rather not. But after a while, your eyes adapt to the light and everything's fine. This is what happens to this guy. His eyes adapt finally and he sees, first of all, he sees colors. He's never seen colors before, you know? Well, the human visual system has two sets of light receptors, rods and cones. Cones see color, rods see black and white. Cones need more light to operate. Not all the species have uh, this visual system. For example, dogs do not see colors. So by the way, if you're thinking about buying your dog a TV set, just get the black and white, save your money. You don't need a color. Um, and we used to do an experiment if you want to try this uh, in, in sensation and perception class in psychology. Sit in a room uh, about sundown, if you get sunlight coming into the room and just fixate on an object. For example, I'm looking at the corner of my study down and see a red lamp. Okay, if I were doing this at sunset, there would come a point at which that red lamp would change to gray. Well, your lamp changes color? No, but your cones cut out and your rods continue to operate. So you're now no longer seeing the color you were seeing before because of the low levels of light, but now you're only seeing uh, shades of, of black and white and gray. And that's you know, what happens to this guy. He sees, he, he sees himself clearly as hands and he sees other people that have hands as clearly as he can see his. He sees other people, he sees horses, he sees birds, he sees rivers, he sees grass, mountains. None, none, none of this has ever seen before. He's just overwhelmed. And then after a while he comes to himself and thinks, oh my God, my, my friends are back in the cave. I better go tell them and let them come out you know, and see for themselves. So he does, he sneaks back in the cave he tells his friends, and what do you think they do? They laugh at him. Oh, you idiot. But what do you mean there's another world out there? This is, this is all there is. This is what we've seen all our lives. This is it, right? This is Plato's allegory of the cave. It's supposed to be uh, an analogy about the philosopher, how difficult it is and painful it is, uh, just uncomfortable it is to come to a knowledge of the truth. But then when you try to convey that knowledge to the average person, they laugh. Um, what do we see here? No, well, looks like a shadow, shadow of a man with a top hat and a cane. And usually we expect a shadow to resemble the object which casts a shadow. So there should be some man there who's uh, in front of that shadow. Oh, wow. Hmm. Here's a shadow. But the object which casts it is neither a man nor does he have a top hat and cane and so on and so forth. And this raises the question. Maybe Plato was right. Are we just dreaming of shadows? He asked this question some time ago. Um, the things which are least real are the things which we can see or touch. The twilight world of change and decay, as Plato puts it. And to um, put someone else's words in Plato's mouth, uh, perhaps. We all suffer from cave consciousness in that twilight world. Cave consciousness is a kind of sleep. And finding one's way out of the cave is a kind of waking up. Hey, shouldn't Plato be getting uh, residuals, screenwriting residuals for The Matrix? You seen that film? The Matrix. You gotta remember the, uh, the humans floating around in the vats of KY jelly, tubes and wires keeping them alive, stimulating their brains to make them believe that they were experiencing the real world, the world we all think we know. Well, uh, almost 20 year old spoiler alert here, some of them come out and find that the real world was a desolate wasteland and the lives everyone thought they were living were just fabrications fed into their brains. A select few were rescued from the illusion, but some of them were so unhappy in the real world that they chose to return to the illusion. But Neo and the others who who chose to stay and fight were the philosophical heroes of the movie choosing truth at the cost of comfort and happiness. Yes. 
the Matrix. The original woke guys, perhaps, if Plato wasn't the original woke guy. Um, what is the Matrix but Plato's cave reimagined? Hmm? What is wokeness like according to Plato? What happens once we get out of the cave? Well, the physical eye deceives us. We have to train ourselves. We learn to use our mind's eye instead to acquire knowledge. Uh, the physical eye itself is useless when the mind is blind. But most of us are walking around blind with our eyes wide shut most of the time, says Plato. This occurs because the superficial twilight world of change, decay, and shadows, this is what the physical eye sees, distracts us from the realities which otherwise the mind's eye might perceive. Ordinary sense experience, in other words, stands in the way of good sense. Now, as in the matrix, what most of the people call the real world, walking around in cubicle land, you know, you worry about your first world problems, that's the most real. Uh, for Plato, that's the least real. Um, that which is most real escapes ordinary sense perception. And if we want to, if we struggle to look beyond the mere world of change and decay, then we might hope to grasp the real world with our mind's eye. Plato's big takeaway from this is a realization that's going to become characteristic of rationalism. We should mistrust what our senses seem to teach us. We rely on eyes. Now, later on, fast forward a little bit, uh, in the 17th century, John Locke's going to say famously, there's nothing in the mind that's not first in the senses. And he means this as a countermand to Plato. Nothing in the senses which is not first in the mind is what Plato in effect says, although not in so many words. In saying this, Plato stands common sense on its head because for Plato, the real is what we don't see and what we see is unreal. Consequence of this is that most of us are deceived ordinarily, thoroughly, and most of the time. Now, Plato does not use this term, false consciousness. It's a famous term from philosophy, but in effect, he says we suffer from it. Whose term is this? This is Marx's term. Um, the notion that humans are deceived routinely about our circumstances. By the way, a lot of people don't think of Marx as a philosopher. But yeah, he was a philosophy major. Would have been a philosophy professor if his politics had not gotten in the way. We'll come to that down the road. Marx, however, had a fairly, um, uh, should we say, narrow focus. He was, he was worried about money. Uh, we are deceived about capital, about money, about economic exploitation. You know, one of the salutary things about Marx is he's, he's such, a, he's so acerbic, you know. Basically, he says, I can tell you're lying. Your lips are moving and the subject is money. So often that's the truth. But Plato, however, is much more radical than Marx. Plato thinks false consciousness goes much, much deeper than even Marx imagined. It's not just money, it's everything. Hmm? The message in any case from both of them is quit your sleepwalking, here's your wake up call. Hmm? Now, people don't like to hear this. Uh, still here is the philosophy, wake up call. You'd best unscrew yourself, whether we get it from Plato or from Marx or from Jean-Paul Sartre or ooh, who, who's this other philosopher over here on the right? Did the proctologist find your head yet, private cowboy? Hmm. Psychologists suspect that some people may be delusional. Philosophers suspect that all people may be delusional. And Plato was the one who started it. Hmm? Ever heard of beer goggles? Well, Plato's message is we all wear cave goggles. Do cave goggles work? Do beer goggles work? Yes, they do. But that's not a recommendation for them. Here's proof the beer goggles work. Uh, look at her up there on the left. 8 p.m. by 10 p.m. she's looking a little better. And by closing time, you done drunk that poor girl pretty. Unless you think this is a sexist point, it works for the guys too, as you can see below. They get handsomer and handsomer. For Plato, uh, learning philosophy is like sobering up, como un plato de menudo. Um, the cure for being stuck in the twilight world of change and decay, being a prisoner in the, uh, to the physical senses in the cave, and stuck behind cave goggles is to get woke. So join the Alumni Association, the Plato's Cave Alumni. Out of the cave, do graduate, please. Rationalism 102, René Descartes. Now, Plato has a very distinctive way of arguing the case for rationalism in which he, in effect, makes the metaphysical tail wag the epistemological dog with his, his two worlds and upside downness. And when people talk about Platonism, that's uh, as often as not what they mean. It's possible to sort out the rationalist epistemology, though, from the Platonic metaphysics. 
uh, Descartes has a somewhat different way to put the case for rationalism and against empiricism. Their differences notwithstanding, though, Plato and Descartes agree on one central point, that is, senses. Our senses deceive us. Hmm? Plato uses the example of, of dreaming. I'm accustomed to sleep and in my dreams to imagine the same things that lunatics imagine when awake. Ever have this dream? You're falling into a bottomless pit and then you wake up. <laughs> it was only a dream. But your heart's pounding and you're sweating and, and you're all agitated, right? It seems so very real psychologically when you were going through the experience. But of course, then you get back up and get a little perspective and you say, oh, I see what was really happening. We all have um, strange dreams. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story on myself. Here's, here's my neurosis. I have this recurring dream. I'm back in high school. It's the end of the senior year. And if I don't pass my math exam, I'm going to fail. Not only are they not going to give me my high school diploma, they're going to take away my college degrees too. Now, that's dumb. And the thing is in the dream, I know it's dumb. Why do I want a high school diploma if I already have college degrees? I mean, a high school diploma is just a stepping stone to get to those college degrees, right? So, but even though I know it's stupid, I'm still worked up. So I'm running around the, the building, I haven't been to class for months, can't remember where my locker is. At least I could get my math book and, and swat it up. I'm trying to remember what my teacher looks like so I can fall on my knees and go, please, 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 please. And then I wake up. Well, I used to think this was just my neurosis. Well, it, it is my neurosis, but not just my neurosis. I was having a conversation a couple of decades ago now with a woman in Paris, an American woman, and uh, she said, oh no, I have this dream too. And uh, by the way, it's a very common dream among educated people. It's a dream of, of not deserving what you've done and having people find out and having your accomplishments snatched away from you. Yes, so I got good news guys and I got bad news. As you become more educated men and women, this dream is going to become your neurosis too. So look forward. Um, dreams are kind of funny, you know, when they're going on, they seem to be real. And it's only when you step out of that state of awareness that you say, oh, it was only a movie, or it was only a dream. But um, things are not altogether clear. Um, La vie est un rêve, se réveille que tu, says Virginia Woolf. Life is but a dream. It's the awakening that kills us. So maybe we are not uh, uh, dead yet. And uh, we're not... Uh, uh, not where, where we think we are either. Le rêve est une seconde vie, says Gerard de Naval, the, the French poet. The dream is a second life. Um, poor Naval, he was, um, he was a very eccentric character. He had a pet lobster, which he would walk on leash in the streets of Paris. And people say, Naval, why a pet lobster? And he said, well, <laughs> they're so much cleaner than dogs and cats. Uh, he, um, he died an unfortunate death. In those days, um, uh, what did Anatole France say? Uh, uh, the law in its uh, majesty forbids the rich and the poor alike to sleep under bridges. You, you couldn't sleep rough. You would be arrested uh, and uh, never get out of jail, basically. So what some enterprising people would do is they would string a, a rope between two trees or two lampposts and they would charge a sou a penny for a poor guy to uh, stand up like a horse sleeping on his feet, but put his, lay his head against the rope as if it were a pillow and that way he could get some sleep. And Naval did this. He was the only one on the rope that night, though, and it was kind of loose and it got tangled around and then he hanged, unfortunately, poor guy. Um, here's another take on dreams. Oh, I suppose I should give the translation here. Um, Once upon a time, I, Chuang Tzu, this is the Taoist sage Chuang Tzu, uh, Chuang Tzu dreamed I was a butterfly, flying happily here and there, enjoying uh, life without knowing who I was. Suddenly I woke up and I was indeed Chuang Tzu. But here's the problem. Did Chuang Tzu dream he was the butterfly? Or did the butterfly dream he was Chuang Tzu? This is not easy to sort. Hmm? Um, Descartes actually uses this example. Has anybody ever heard of phantom pain? So what's a phantom pain? I usually have a few nursing students in class there. They're sure to, to tell the rest of the class if they don't know. Phantom pain is a pain that people experience after amputation. Let's say you have your leg taken off at the knee and for a time you feel pain in your toes. Now this is, is puzzling, but it, it's as puzzling as to, to anyone uh, as it is to the person experiencing it because they're acutely painfully aware they no longer have those toes and yet they still feel pain in the toes. So what's going on? Well, the pain event is not actually happening in the limb 
pain event is happening between these two flaps of skin. Hmm? It's in the brain. And what happens with the brain as it develops? You know, when we're first born, we don't have a sense of embodiment, but we develop that over time. For example, you see children lying in a crib, you know, play with those little mobiles that we string up there above the crib. That's not just play, that's work. That's neurological work, that's developmental work. They're coming to develop a sense of where they end, the rest of the world begins. And they're coming also to develop a sense that they have extension. There's a, a age before which you give a child a rattle, they're really fascinated with this rattle, huh? and they don't realize that they're the ones making the rattling noise, and then there comes a point where they realize, oh yeah, I can, I can make it stop, I can make it start, and it's me, that's me doing that. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of developmental work that, that uh, children do by way of getting a sense of agency and embodiment and so on and so forth. And so we learn when we stub our toe, you know, to attribute that pain to this extended limb uh, terminating a toe, but it's actually there's still an event that's taking place up here. And if that limb is removed, the event can still take place up here. What happens, and we're coming to learn more and more about the brain, uh, it's one big area of, 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 of growth in our knowledge, it's very plastic. And the brain can re-knit itself, re-knit some new, new neurological pathways. And what happens eventually is the brain does that. And so the phantom pains will gradually disappear. But isn't it curious that they can happen at all in the first place? So the person that's having the phantom pain is actually having an experience of pain, but they are very much deceived about the nature of that experience and about the, when they attribute that experience to this limb which is gone, they don't quite understand what's going on, or we can. Uh, here's another example. Anybody ever heard of a sensory deprivation chamber? Okay, well, sensory deprivation chamber was actually a, a research tool developed by John Lilly in the 1940s. He's also the guy who did the pioneering research on dolphin intelligence. Um, but the, the sensory deprivation chamber, volunteers only, um, was a tank of water at exactly body temperature, 98.6. Now, one of the ways in which I know I'm in the world is I feel it's cool, it's hot, I feel a breeze on my skin. I know where I end and the rest of the reality takes up. Um, but if the body, if, if the water is at body temperature, that uh, barrier is erased, at least temporarily. Uh, it's completely dark, it's completely soundproof, there's no smell, there's no taste, no, there's no input coming into the self from sensory apparatus. The lid comes down and there you are. And what happens is this, people in sensory deprivation chambers hallucinate. Mm -hmm. They see marching violins playing themselves, they see pink elephants. Um, now, hallucination is not a good thing, uh, usually, except under these extreme conditions, it's better than the alternative, which is, if you lose a sense of self and otherness altogether, this way madness lies. Here comes the dissolution of the personality. So, mm, concocting hallucinations for yourself is at least a way of giving yourself an ongoing sense of otherness, self and other, and preserving uh, boundaries of self and preserving the sense of personality and and uh, and sanity really so yes uh, pink elephants uh, better than the alternative mm -hmm. and we've all probably had experiences of visual illusions i've used this one for years you know i know that those dots are not moving and i know that that surface is not three-dimensional i can even take my hand reach out and touch it and confirm that to myself by means of, of uh, other evidence but but it just looks to me it always has looked to me, it still looks to me, even if I know what's going on, that it's an illusion, like there's motion and depth there. So our brains can do that uh, for us, could deceive us in that way. So here's the problem. Whether we're talking about dreams or phantom pains or hallucinations or visual illusions, I take my perception as corresponding to some object outside of me. Hmm? There's reason to believe though that it's taking place only inside of me that I'm merely projecting outwardly like I would project, for example, a sense of, of having limbs where I don't actually have limbs. So if this can happen to me once, how do I know that this doesn't happen often or even all the time with my perceptions? Hmm? How can I be sure that I'm not dreaming now? Even when I think I'm waking up, I might still be dreaming. Hmm? So if I could be deceived some of the time, how do I know that I'm not being deceived all of the time? And that's the problem from which Descartes departs. Now, here's how he sets out to deal with that problem. He has a very radical idea, clever idea, um, which we call the Cartesian method. And uh, I always tell my students at this point, be sure you get this in your notes. What's the Cartesian method? What method does Descartes adopt? De omnibus dubitandum, he says, doubt everything. Hi, Descartes, I'm going to do a springhouse cleaning of my head. Everything 
that I think is true, that I've been taught coming up, that I think I see in front of me, all that kind of stuff, I'm going to doubt as if it were false. Until or unless, and this day may never come, until or unless I can find something which I cannot doubt, if that happens, then I know something I know for sure. And if I can find one thing I can know for sure, perhaps I can build on that and maybe find some others and maybe even get back to uh, a knowledge of an objective world outside of myself, other minds, other persons, other things, etc. That's where he thinks he might go. And indeed, spoiler alert, we're going to read Descartes down the road. That's where he thinks he does, in fact, get in the end. Now, the beginning point, though, is radical skepticism of a specific kind. Ordinarily, skeptics seek to undermine knowledge. And by the way, that is a perfectly legitimate move within philosophy. Uh, Cursed be he who removes his neighbor's boundary stones. So says Deuteronomy and the Book of Common Prayer uh, uh, agrees, but <clears throat> philosophy does not worship in that particular chapel. Uh, it's perfectly, uh, perfectly all right for a philosopher to say, well, here's something that's false. Well, but what do you have to put it in its place? I don't know. And if you don't know, that's fine too. Uh, so skepticism <clears throat> as, a, as an end in itself um, can be a good thing in philosophy. Descartes doesn't just do that though, notice this. <clears throat> he is skeptical, but not in order to remain in his skepticism, but to find rather some way out of his skepticism by starting there in the first place. So where does he go? Does this mean that Descartes is just trapped in a whirlpool of doubt, starting out by doubting? So we follow had his argument. After he's doubting everything he can, he arrives at the one fact he cannot doubt and draws a famous conclusion. Okay, so I have to adapt this a little bit for the, um, for the uh, YouTube video, but uh, imagine I'm standing in front of my ordinary class, okay? And so I look out and I see a bunch of faces. I see maybe 20, 30, 40 students, and I see a uh, floor and I see some walls and I see a ceiling and some lights. Um, I might be deceived about all of those things. Those might all be illusions in my head, but, 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 one of my students might say, I'm real, I'm here, to which I could then reply, yeah, but see, that's your part in the script. You're supposed to say that in the movie that's running in my head. Well, um, I'm doubting, I'm doubting, I'm doubting, I'm doubting, I'm doubting, and finally I come to realize one thing. There's one thing I cannot doubt. What is that? Well, I can't doubt that I'm doubting while well, I'm doubting. And if I'm doubting, who's doing the doubting? Oh, it's me. So if there's doubting going on, doubting is a species of thinking. If there's thinking going on, there must be an I to be doing the thinking. And he comes to the famous conclusion, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Hmm? Uh, sometimes known as the cogito, by the way, I tell my students uh, when we're in class, get this down in your notes, very important thing. This is uh, one of the things for which Descartes is famous, and um, it is the conclusion of an argument. That's what we have to recognize. It's not just something he pulls out of uh, nowhere. Um, I'm doubting, I'm doubting, I'm doubting. There's one thing I can't doubt, um, and that is that I exist. Mm -hmm. um, the smart alky philosopher Sidney Hook tells a story. A student came up to him one day after class and says, Professor Hook, can you prove that I exist? And Hook just looked at him and said, who wants to know? One of those questions, if you can ask it, you've already answered it. Well, so here's Descartes. He's posed his problem. He's started down the road of his skeptical method, Cartesian method, and he's arrived at a conclusion that there is at least one thing he cannot doubt. There's at least one thing in which he can be certain of that is himself. So he's got a solution. But solutions bring problems. Okay, he solved the problem of can we know anything by proving that he can know his own existence, but he's done so at the price of denying everything else in the world. So he's painting himself into a corner as he boxed himself in, uh, built, a, built a brick wall with himself inside it. Descartes right now is in a position known as solipsism. Solipsism is uh, from two Latin words, solo and ipso, solo only and ipso to exist. It's the view that I and only I exist. Now, solipsism is difficult, if not impossible to refute, you know, Again, if my student says to me, but I'm here, I could just reply, yeah, but see, that's your part in the script. You're just, you're still a character in the movie that's going in my head. Solipsism has certain problems. One of them is not consistency. It is very consistent. You know? Any counter evidence, presumed counter, presumed counter evidence can be assimilated to it. 
However, at the same time, solipsism does have one big difficulty. While he was alive, and he had a very long life, 98 years, Richard Russell was Mr. Philosophy. If you had a philosophy question, you could write him a postcard, uh, Richard Russell, Trinity College, Cambridge, that would get to him. And now he might not answer all the questions, and once in a while he did. And he tells the following story. Um, a correspondent whose uh, sex chivalry forbids me to mention asked him, uh, Dear Professor Russell, uh, I'm a solipsist, and I find the most convincing philosophy, but I can't convince anybody else. Can you help me? Hmm. I'm a solipsist, but I can't convince uh, anyone else. Uh, I, I ignore, quote, you, unquote, because I'm a solipsist. I can't believe I'm the only solipsist on this planet. Okay. Thing to recognize about Descartes' argument, uh, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am not just a cute tag phrase. Uh, it's not the, the New York version, a little black, a little black dress, therefore, I am. A student gave me this one many years ago. I'm pink, therefore, I'm spam. There are lots of philosophy jokes, and it seems most of them turn around one version or another of Descartes' cogito. Um, it is, however, the conclusion of a reasoned argument. I'm going to doubt everything I can, but I cannot doubt that I'm doubting, therefore I cannot doubt that I exist. This proposition, he says, I am, I exist, whenever it is uttered by me or conceived by the mind, necessarily is true. That's as strong as truth can be, necessary. Hmm? Descartes is trying to show that because he's thinking, even when he's doubting, there must be someone there doing the doubting, and that's himself. And as long as he's thinking, as long as he's doubting, to the basic fact of his existence cannot be denied. So look at how Descartes operates. Does he appeal to his experience? No, he says experience can deceive us. Uh, dreams and illusions and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't appeal to his senses. Hmm? But hold that thought, by the way, because we're going to see that just because one takes a rationalist position, for example, to be skeptical of what senses can tell us, does not mean that one is oblivious to the existence of sense experience. Descartes is going to talk about that later when we come to read his meditations. We'll see how that works. But rather, what he does is he appeals to pure reason and concepts. He says, let, let my mind deny everything that my senses tells me. Let me treat it all as false, but I still cannot get away from the fact that yes, pure reason tells me that I am conscious, that I exist, and I cannot not exist as long as that is the case. Hmm? Therefore, the path to knowledge does not lie through experience and these unworthy sense percepts, but it lies through concepts. And concepts are things that my intellect apprehends directly. This is why Descartes is one of the rationalists rather than the empiricists. Okay, so Plato and Descartes. Most people are deceived most of the time about most things. We can't trust our senses, so our best bet is to fall back on the power of our intellect. Uh, both Plato and Descartes um, take an armchair view. Hmm? Uh, I can sit in my armchair, I can work this stuff out in my head. And rationalists think this is a strength. Uh, one of the things empiricists now is that armchair work is really uh, all that strong. Um, there's another point on which Plato and Descartes agree, we'll come back to this in another context. Um, ideas, um, knowledge, the set of ideas in which pure reason arrives will be innate. They're going to be innate because they're universal, true for all people at all times and all places. Uh, because it base such ideas are themselves eternal, perfect, unchanging. Hmm? Okay, so to sum up, the rationalist point of view is going to do two things. It's going to trust contemplative concepts and mistrust sense percepts. Concepts are tremendously important. Percepts are squishy. Hmm? All right, having looked at rationalism, let's go on and look at the counterpoint empiricism. For, from the Pierce's point of view, received ideas deceive, be careful of those things, trust the senses instead. And by the way, when empiricists refer to experience, they mean sense experience, that is the five senses, touch, vision, taste, smell, hearing. Okay, let's look at the first poster boy for empiricism. This is Francis Bacon. By the way, does Bacon look like anyone you may have seen before? A little bit like Shakespeare, perhaps? Well, actually, they were contemporaries, and there's, there's always been a question in Shakespeare scholarship. You know, this young boy from Stratford, he was poorly educated, had small Latin, less Greek, as he put it. And yet he comes to the letter and he writes all these plays about history, you know, Henry IV and Julius Caesar, and writes about foreign places, Verona, uh, etc., uh, Merchant of Venice. Um, how did he possibly get that knowledge? Maybe he didn't write those plays. Maybe somebody else wrote them using his name. 
And there have been a number of candidates uh, throughout the years, including uh, Queen Elizabeth herself, but also including Francis Bacon. And this is one of those controversies that goes on and I never will have a solution, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a bit of fun to play with. Anyway, Francis Bacon, early 17th century, um, say late 16th, early 17th, same time as, as Shakespeare. The growth of an articulated empiricism with Bacon and others uh, starting at that period, the early modern period, flows from a deep frustration with rationalism. If you look at the history of it, rationalism has had rather a long run uh, from Plato onward, uh, whereas empiricism really uh, gets going in the 17th century onward to our own time. Um, oh, there might have been a kind of a dust bowl, you know, variety of empiricism against which Plato was reacting when he, when he talked about, you know, how people are are prone to live in the twilight world of, 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 of change and decay and, and pay attention to their senses even though the senses deceive them. But as a clearly articulated philosophical movement, no, not until the 17th century, whereas rationalism has had, you know, articulation from uh, Plato, at least onward, uh, including Aristotle. And, and Aristotle's uh, tremendous influence in the Middle Ages will come to that. Um, so the full formal statement of empiricism comes at the end of the Middle Ages, early modern era, it's a reaction against the long-standing rationalism. And uh, round one, Descartes takes on Aristotle and the Aristotelians. Uh, Aristotle had what was called the old organon, the old body of knowledge. One of the title, title of one of Bacon's works is the new scientific organon. Um, Hello, fresh, says Bacon, we need to make a new start. 17th century, 16th, 17th centuries, era of a scientific revolution, big scientific revolution. Newton, Galileo, Copernicus, uh, those guys. Um, and Bacon looks at these developments and he says, you know, the old organon given to us by Aristotle has become sterile and unproductive. We've become fixated upon what Bacon calls the idols of the mind, the same tired old stuff. And we need a new organon based on experience, meaning of course, sense experience. The Latin experientia uh, corresponds to the Greek empiria. That's where we get our word empiricism. In other words, observation, by the way, be careful. There is a difference between empiricism and imperialism. The words sound similar, but they mean completely different things. I sometimes hear students talking about rationalism versus imperialism. No, no, no. no. Imperialism is a viewpoint about uh, who runs the world, and empiricism is a viewpoint about knowledge. Very, very different. Now, Plato is weird. Aristotle is weird, too. Aristotle, at least in the Middle Ages, imagined Aristotle was the archetypal know-it-all. If Aristotle said it, it was true. If Aristotle didn't say it, it was not worth worrying about. Paradoxically, Aristotle tends to be renowned for his biology. Um, he did make some, some biological observations, did some research. He was exiled for a while to an island and uh, spent time looking at sea creatures in the shallows and did some interesting things with them. But as we'll see in a minute, he says some things about biology, which are just completely incredible. Um, the fetus, for example, says Aristotle is formed by semen coagulating with menstrual blood. No. Uh, nobody knew about ovaries during Aristotle's time, but he was sure, nevertheless, that the right dominant side of the body was hotter and nobler and produced male fetuses. The male embryo receives a rational soul after 40 days, the female after 90 days. Hmm. Uh, Aristotle quite confidently asserts that women have fewer teeth than men. Uh, Grandpa and grandma with little granddaughter at the breakfast table. Rose says, Grandpa is an interesting piece of trivia. It was originally Aristotle who mistakenly believed that women had fewer teeth than men. And she thinks for a minute and says, why didn't you just ask Mrs. Aristotle to open her mouth? Well, yeah. Why didn't he do the obvious, what well, seems to be the obvious for us, trust the evidence of his senses? Wasn't Aristotle smarter than a fifth grader? Well, apparently it didn't th seem important to Aristotle, nor to many people who follow Aristotle for that matter, uh, to ask uh, Mrs. Aristotle, for example, to open her mouth and just uh, do, a, do a quick check. Um, so Bacon worries about this. You know, he worries about the bad influence of Aristotle and his particular idols of the mind. He too wants to clear out the rubbish uh, from our mental addicts as Descartes did in his own way. Um, the heavy hand of the past, the old organon, and Bacon says we need a new organon. Here's an example of, of Aristotle's influence, a baleful influence, uh, as, as, as Bacon would regard it. Usury. Okay, what's usury? Usury means a couple of things. 
it was prohibited uh, in medieval Europe, and uh, this was based on a certain sort of biological analogy from Aristotle. It was prohibited to Christians. Um, Jews were not subject to that prohibition. That's one reason for the stereotype of the Jewish money, money lender, uh, Shylock, for example, in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Jews were not allowed into the professions, were not allowed to own land and property, et cetera. Their, their economic opportunities were restricted, but this is one thing they could do, which, uh, for which they had no competition from their Christian counterparts. Um, stereotypes sometimes have a foundation, in fact, although they may be, uh, in fact, exaggerated. Usury, uh, and by the way, usury eventually disappears. So I'll mention uh, the prohibition against usury, at least eventually disappears. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, usury meant at the time in the, in the Middle Ages any taking of interest. Nowadays, it tends to mean the exorbitant taking of interest, like you know, 20% uh, VIG uh, on your credit card. But the usury that was prohibited in Europe was any taking of interest. And here's the reasoning from Aristotle. Okay. If you take, well, I have two points here. Uh, so actually I have some old, old German marks. I have a two mark, old, old Buddhist mark piece and a fitting, huh? And I rub them together and I leave them, uh, leave them uh, in, a, in a closet. Uh, come back, what do I have? Do I have more money? No, I don't, I have exactly the same. Whereas if I take two rabbits, male and female, let's say, put them together in a closet and come back in a month, what do I have? I have a bunch of bunnies. Well, that's okay because that's nature. They have the rabbit habit and, you know, it is natural for living species to multiply. Money, though, is metal. Well, first of all, that's wrong three ways from Sunday, but that was Aristotle's conception. Money is metal. Metal is, unlike rabbits, it's sterile, not fertile. And therefore, to force money to reproduce in this way by making it pay interest is a crime against nature in exactly the same sense that, let's say, buggering a sheep would be a crime against nature. And therefore, it needs to be prohibited in law. That was Aristotle's reasoning. And so for the longest time, um, at least within Christendom among Christians, uh, it was prohibited to take interest, uh, to pay out interest or to receive interest. I'm wondering, well, what does that do to a banking system? Uh, it basically doesn't exist. The reason usury went away, the Catholic Church prohibited it, given the reasoning of Aristotle. The Catholic Church needed to build St. Peter's Basilica. That's the St. Peter's that you always see, you know, where the Pope comes out in the balcony and the crowds. And, and um, they needed to raise money. So they gradually relaxed the prohibitions on usury that went away. But you see the same prohibitions today, for example, in Islamic republics for exactly the same reason, because they too adopt the medieval reasoning of Aristotle that to, to allow money to reproduce is a crime against nature. And so banking is very difficult to do. They have ways around it. Uh, they have um, associations. So if you're a member of an association and you have some friends who have some more money, they can lend you some, or you, they, you can lend them today and they can lend you the next time. But it's, you know, it's dependent on personal relationships, whereas banking is not at all dependent on an interpersonal relationship. If I walk into a bank and I have the collateral, I can be alone. Doesn't matter who I am, they're likely enough to know me, whatever. Don't need that kind of personal touch. Yeah, so, so usury was prohibited, the, the, the taking of any interest or the collecting of any interest whatsoever. Now, that, that's not the way in which we use the term usury today, if we even use it at all. When we use it today, we have a much more restricted meaning. It is the taking of exorbitant interest. Here's a, an account from the LA Times business section some time ago. Capital One's raising its APR from 9.9% to 17.9%. And that's for the better customers, those who pay off each month. Up to 30% for those who miss a single payment. And the worst here, worst offender here is payday advance, which can cost more than 400% per year to borrow money. How does payday advance work? Let's say you've got too much month and too little money. So you go down, payday advance, you write them a check for $300, let's say. And you say, now, I don't have any money in the bank now. I'm not getting paid till the first of the month. So please, please, please hold my check and don't cash it to them. They say, okay, that's cool. We'll do that. So your $300 check, they give you $255 cash. Cool. I got some money. I can go down and I'll cop a pair of shoes, whatever I need. And then they cash your check on the first of the month. Well, if you had too much month and too little money this month, and you took out a $300 loan, how likely is you're going to have the same situation at the end of the next month? Well, then you go do the same thing again. Roll it over and over and over and over. Um, okay, that's 
$255 today for $300 there's just 17.6% interest up front. Um, it's like you take every dollar and you get change, you keep 82 cents for yourself if you throw 18 cents in the trash. Not really right. And if you flip the loan, you do it again next time, um, you flip it, let's say eight times for two weeks each, $325 costs $793. That's like taking your dollar, throwing away 60 cents and keeping 40 cents for yourself. And if you do this all year, it's like keeping the 18 cents and throwing away the 82 cents in the trash. Now, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I used to work for the public school system. My day job, kind of like musicians, you know, I like to teach philosophy, but they don't pay me a lot. Uh, not enough to make a living. So, you know, like a musician, you want to do your gig at night, you got to have a day job, don't quit your day job. That's what I did. Worked in a special education with severely handicapped teenagers. Um, these are people that uh, had bodies of 12 to 22 year olds and minds of maybe one to three year olds. So there were a lot of basic things they didn't understand. Well, we had one kid, he loved sodas. And every day dad would give him a dollar for a soda. Now, he didn't know what a dollar was. It was a piece of green paper. Um, but what he knew was when nutrition time came around, he could go to that nice lady in the cafeteria, give her this piece of paper. She would give him a soda and two little shiny things in his hand. Oh, cool. So he'd go drink the soda. He'd bring back the shiny things to her. She'd give him another soda. Wonderful. So one day he goes in, he gives her the green paper. She gives him the soda and the shiny things. Comes back, she won't take the shiny things. Well, what happened was the price of a soda went up from 50 cents to 60 cents. He, he doesn't have any idea what money is. So he takes that 40 cents, throws it in the trash. You, you could laugh. It's funny. You know? Problem is, this guy has an excuse. He's developmentally dis delayed. What about the guy who goes to payday loan, keeps 18 cents and throws away the 82 percent? What's his excuse? I'm making light of it here, but it's really tragic. Uh, our, our servicemen in particular are particularly victimized by the payday loan industry. It is a racket. Uh, Montel says, come on, you deserve the money. Get a short-term cash loan up to $1,000 by tomorrow. Hmm? And you're going to pay 459% over the course of the year. Help me understand the logic of this. I need $1,000 today. Thus, I have to get a money mutual loan. Therefore, I'm going to have $5,600, $5,600 to pay back at the end of the year to money mutual. How does that work? Okay, Aristotle's old organon. Um, takes it that facts are facts only as, in as much as they correspond to prior metaphysical scheme, that relations of ideas determine matters of fact. Bacon says, no, it's the other way around. Matters of fact are, do determine and ought to determine the relations of our ideas. Now, ever since Thales, the whole tradition of philosophy has been CCR, comprehensively critical rationalism. Whether you take a rationalist point of view, or whether you take an empiricist point of view, this is no less true. Look out for false consciousness. Avoid gullibility. This has been the message of all of them. Plato's point was that it was uncritical and gullible not to look beyond the surface appearances. Descartes' point is that we're deceived routinely, so try not to be deceived routinely. Bacon's point is that there are different ways to become gullible and uncritical. And for him, chief among them was to accept received ideas. So they're all trying to avoid gullibility. They have different takes on what it takes to do that. Bacon's remedy was drastic, subordinating relations of ideas entirely to matters of fact. And he also worried about the armchair. You know, how much can we actually know by sitting in the armchair and consulting our existing stock of ideas? Bacon's answer is not very much. We need some observations. We need some new input from observations. Now, you might say, okay, there are some general truths that we could get from an armchair. You know, for example, one plus one equals two. You don't have to have any experience to figure that out. I mean, you don't you don't inductively learn that from putting the blocks together in elementary school. If you don't grasp that idea, <clears throat> the blocks make no sense in the first place. And you could do this blindfolded, sitting in your armchair. Mm -hmm. And possibly uh, you could get some other things too. I mean, St. Anselm sits in his armchair and comes up to the conclusion that God exists. Joe Posat sits in his armchair. Again, this refers to that earlier talk. Comes up with the opposite conclusion. God does not exist. Descartes sits in the armchair, comes up with the conclusion that I exist. Mm -hmm. But then pure reason alone seems to get us very dubious propositions like women have fewer teeth than men. Usury is a crime against nature. The sun goes around the earth. Hmm? Regarding science, pure reason alone uh, is what gave us the geocentric falsehood. When we started to look in the telescope instead of sitting in the chair, that's where we got started to sort things out vis-a-vis -vis the cosmos. Um, 
So the empiricist uh, message at least is, human knowledge needs something more like Galileo's telescope, something less like Aristotle's armchair. Yo, Jack, watch what's in front of your bloody nose already. Why aren't you looking? Why aren't you counting those teeth? This is Bacon's message. And Bacon's strictures made an immediate difference in the 17th century. You know, this is a time when people are beginning to look and beginning to learn new things. But Leeuwenhoek, uh, the first microscope, begins to see microscopic organisms. Galileo's got his telescope. He can see the details of the moon, the big things far away, the little things near at hand, opening up whole new vistas to us. Harvey discovers that the heart is a pump. It's not the seat of love and emotion. It's just a pump. It circulates the blood. Okay, that's a big deal. Um, Pasteur comes along with the German theory, you know, the whole story there. One more thing, in championing, championing the progress of science of observation or speculation, Bacon added that there's a scientific method characterized by a particular kind of logic, inductive logic. And this came about at the expense of deductive logic. Now, we're not going to take this topic up in, in detail in this course, but uh, there will be people watching this who will be taking the, the uh, other course we do, we only do two courses, the course on deductive logic. So this will be particularly important uh, for that. Um, the, the rise of inductive logic came about at the expense of deductive logic. And this was influential for quite a long time from the 17th century to the 20th century. Um, Self-conscious Baconian inductivism became the hallmark of philosophy of science, very, very influential. Uh, down to uh, almost our own day. Um, already as early as the 17th century, uh, Bacon is glorified in uh, Thomas Spratt's History of the Royal Society of London. He was a member of the Royal Society. His empiricism was a major ideology there and subsequently too. Um, Thomas Young, a 19th century physicist, really quite typical here. Bacon has first taught the world the true method of the study of nature and rescued science from that barbarism in which the followers of, followers of Aristotle by a too servile imitation of their master had involved it. Hmm? Um, matters of fact need to produce relations of ideas by process of inductive reasoning. This is the Baconian method. Darwin himself says this. Uh, I worked on true Baconian principles and without any theory collected facts on a wholesale scale. This is what any good scientist would say in the 19th century. We do know, however, historians do know quite a lot about Darwin and how he did what he did and what he did does not resemble his description of it, but it was the kind of self description that people would typically use throughout this period and indeed again into, into well into the 20th century. We remember Bacon for two legacies. First his empiricism and secondly his inductivism as a philosophy of science. Um, Bacon was critical of Aristotelian gullibility in the name of scientific advancement. He also blamed Aristotle's deductive logic for the uh, demise of science and thought it needed to be replaced. In the 20th century, Karl Popper is going to come along, and this will be the subject of our third problem, uh, what's the goal of our knowledge. He's going to drive a wedge between these two parts of Bacon. He's going to say, yeah, Bacon was quite on the mark about uh, Aristotelian gullibility, but he missed the mark in thinking that there was such a thing as inductivism and that inductivism was different from and superior to deductivism. Popper is going to want to show, this is, this is a very, uh, very clever and important thesis. First of all, there is no such thing as inductivism. And secondly, examples of what typically pass for inductivism, if you look at them, turn out to be examples rather of deductive reasoning, only a known bad form of deductive reasoning. But in any case, that's not a problem because uh, appropriate forms of deductive reasoning are actually better characteristic of, and are characteristic actually, of, uh, uh, of what scientists actually do. So for about 300 years, induction was enthroned. And when people thought about deduction, they thought about it in terms of, of medieval scholastics, uh, arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. That was actually a question people took up. Angels don't have any extension in space. So perhaps an infinite number could dance on the head of a pin. Hmm? We don't think that's an important problem now. Popper argued that induction is not a scientific method after all. Uh, scientists test theories via a deductive process known as modus tollens. And again, I won't explic explicate that here, but if you do take the further course on deductive logic, we do it. They'll spend a lot of time there on that. And Popper demonstrated then that there's no, not only no induction, either logical or psychological, but that what passes for 
uh, induction is actually a known and bad form of deduction instead. So it's back. Um, today, uh, deductive logic is no longer shunned as barbarism. Uh, things have changed, but still, uh, we remember Bacon for uh, what he did accomplish and for stating some very basic principles about the importance of concepts over percepts uh, with which we still wrestle today. Empiricism 102, John Locke. Nothing in the mind which is not first in the senses. Um, when Locke says this, he surely has Plato in mind. Bacon made the empiricist case for observation over armchair speculation. What did Locke have to add to this, if anything? Um, we can see four theses in Locke, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on, on this, but just to mention them. Um, one metaphysical thesis, two epistemological theses, and one psychological. There are no innate ideas, and ideas do not predate our biography. The content of the ideas owes everything to nurture, nothing to nature. Excuse me. Matters of fact are disclosed directly by sense experience, which is self-interpreting, and there are no ideas prior to experience. Um, metaph metaphysical thesis, no innate ideas, ideas do not precede biography. Since the dawn of philosophy, thinkers have argued about whether or not we have innate ideas, whether we are born knowing things as Plato believed, or rather as John Locke and other empiricists argued, the mind is a blank slate on which experience writes. Yes, so there the battle lines are drawn. Plato held a peculiar view, and we'll read this when we read the Meno dialogue, um, anamnesis, which means that we, that knowledge is remembering, learning is remembering. Um, all of us are born with our ideas, there's nothing new to learn. You guys know everything there is to know already, it's in the back of your heads, and you just have to draw it out. Descartes agreed with Plato at least that all ideas are innate. Um, John Locke countermands Plato and Descartes. At birth, the mind is empty of any ideas. It's a tabula rasa, Latin for blank slate. Think of a chalkboard or a whiteboard. Um, this means, however, contrary to Plato, that genuine learning can take place. We can learn new things. Somebody can figure out something that nobody has ever known before. When Watson and Crick broke the DNA code early in 1953, they were the first people in ever uh, to have worked that out. Um, but it was a new thing. And of course, now it's old hat. We've assimilated it. Also for John Locke, nurture outweighs nature. Um, nurture uh, is what we get from learning and development. Nature is what we might bring with us at birth. Um, when we read Descartes' uh, meditations, the third meditation, uh, he's going to argue that the idea of God is one of the most clear, distinct ideas that anyone has, and everyone has it. It's something that's innate in us. Yeah, that's pretty weak. I mean, humans notoriously differ about the gods. Um, we would predict, if Descartes was right, that there would be a settled consensus about God, but there isn't. There's absolute dissensus throughout the various world religions. Um, indeed, insofar as there can be anything like a history of ideas, or there could be cultural anthropology, or there could be cognitive developmental psychology, or the comparative study of religion, it would seem that ideas cannot be innate in the sense that either Plato or Descartes thought that they were. And given what we've learned in the 19th, 20th centuries, now 21st century about religion, anthropology, developmental psychology, it seems clear Locke has the better part, uh, Plato and Aristotle the lesser part. And I'm going to kind of fast forward through this again. You can either stop the video and watch or you can look at the handout and or look at the handout when it comes to you. Um, Kant is going to drive a wedge later on between some of Locke's theses in the way, parallel to the way in which Popper will do that for Bacon. So let's sum up rationalism and empiricism thus far up to the 18th century. Plato is the poster boy for rationalism because he directs our attention to what mere appearance distorts, mere sense percepts distort. He appeals to us to quit the cave, graduate, join the alumni association, leave the twilight world of change and decay, use our contemplative power in the analysis of concepts. Descartes, the poster boy for rationalism because he argues, even if we entirely disregard our sense percepts, they remain important truths which are accessible to us through concepts through the use of pure reason alone. Bacon is supposed to be a boy for empiricism because he wants us to reject these idols of the mind, the concepts of the old organon, and use percepts of sense experience, imperia, again, that's where we get our word empiricism, to make direct observations of the world around us. Look what's beyond your bloody nose. Count Mrs. Aristotle's teeth. Hmm? 
Locke is the poster boy for empiricism because he countermands Plato's notion that ideas, concepts, or prior to perceptions. Rather, sense experience is prior to ideas. He says, percepts give rise to concepts, not the other way around. So, a rationalist point of view then will do two things. It will trust contemplative concepts, mistrust sense percepts, and an empiricist point of view is kind of the mirror image. It will trust sense percepts and mistrust contemplative concepts. So they're, they're parallel one to another, uh, like you saw that we could see them in a mirror uh, in something like this way. Um, they engage in a symmetrical critique, they engage in a mutual critique. What's vice for one is virtue for the other, what's virtue for the one is vice for the other. Now, Having pointed out some differences between the rationalist outlook and the empiricist outlook, let me qualify that by noting that these differences are not absolute. There was a book a couple of years, some years ago, um, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. They're from two different planets. Well, that's not even true of men and women. Hmm? The male and female embryos diverge from a common form, uh, the same sort of basic anatomical structure that becomes a penis and a man becomes a clitoris and a woman, um, you know, ovaries and testes, same basic structure that then diverges. Uh, and actually, it turns out that um, even in, in, in adulthood, men have a lot of progesterone, women have a lot of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the male hormone I'm thinking of, it'll come to me, testosterone. Um, it's just in different proportions. It's not that, that women are all progesterone and men are all testosterone, um, but women have more of the female less of the male hormone. So, so there, there's a certain biological overlap even in, uh, where, in, in things like male, female, where we think that they're different. And of course, uh, as um, Anne Fausto Sterling tells us, there are not two sexes. Biologically, there are actually five. Uh, it's complicated. But the same thing is true here. Uh, it's not that, that rationalists and empiricists are on different planets. No, they're quarreling about subjects they hold in common. First, both camps are interested in identifying the sources of human knowledge, they just differ on what those are. Secondly, both are critical. They're interested in identifying and avoiding sources of false consciousness, they just differ on what those are. So, there are ways to contrast rationalism and empiricism, there are ways not to contrast rational and rationalism and empiricism. Um, it would be an elementary mistake, it would be elementary and mistaken to suppose that simply because empiricism criticizes rationalism, that therefore empiricism is not also a doctrine about ideas, but it is. What's the point of paying attention to sense experience if it's not to obtain some better ideas? Hmm? Um, and you know, I often, by way of review, I ask my students, tell me the difference between rationalism and empiricism. And what I often get is, well, rationalism is reason and empiricism is experience. No, that's not good enough. To contrast these two positions, you've got to do that in complete sentences. You can't just do word association and say empiricism is experience. No, empiricism is a view of knowledge that accords a certain privileged position to experience. Yes, that's a good start there, but you gotta do more than just word associate. Likewise, it's not adequate to say if rationalism, it is reason, no. Um, if rationalism says we can rely on pure ideas, does that mean empiricism is irrationalism? No, that, ra that empiricism says we can dispense with ideas altogether, also no. Whether you look at Bacon or whether you look at Locke, empiricism also is trying to sort good ideas from bad ideas. It mistrusts concepts, yes, but only insofar as concepts are not first based on sense experience. But if they are based first on sense experience, then to an empiricist, this is fine and well. So, um, the opposite of rationalism is not irrationalism, mm -hmm. um, not somebody in a straitjacket. Uh, the opposite of rationalism is empiricism, that's a very different thing. And the opposite of empiricism is not woolly headed as somebody with his head in the clouds. No, the opposite of empiricism is rationalism. That's a different thing. Both of these things are competing critiques of false consciousness. Both of them fall under that old tradition of comprehensive and critical rationalism, as proper we call it, uh, which goes all the way back to the beginning of the philosophical tradition in Thales and the Ionian nature philosophers and comes forward from there. Okay, so let's look at where we are by the 18th century. Okay. In this corner, wearing the red trunks, Rene Descartes, the only intelligible things are clear and distinct ideas. These come to us not through sensation, but and not through experience, but through concepts. And in the other corner, wearing the blue trunks, John Locke, there is nothing in the mind which is not first in the senses. Knowledge comes to us through experience and sensation, percepts. Okay. Concepts versus percepts. Now, anybody 
you know the story of the blind men and the elephant? It's an old folk tale. Rudyard Kipling tells it. A bunch of blind men come up to an elephant, and one guy grabs the leg of the elephant. Oh, elephants are like trees. And another grabs the tusk and says, no, elephants are like spears. And another grabs the, the trunk of the elephant's trunk and says, no, elephants are like hoses. And someone grabs his tail and says, oh, elephants are like ropes. So who's right and who's wrong? Well, they're all right and they're all wrong. They've all got a piece of the action, but they don't have the whole picture. Hmm? There's always a spoiler who comes along and says, the elephant is more than each individual blind man thinks that it is. In this case, the spoiler is a German fellow uh, by the name of Immanuel Kant. We've come across him uh, in context of morality. Kant steps in as kind of referee. Hmm? The rationalists say we get our knowledge from concepts, the empiricists from percepts. Kant says this, percepts without concepts are blind, concepts without percepts are empty. We need both. And the key idea for Kant is the notion of categories. Categories are things which are in the mind, but not first in the senses. They do, however, allow us to sort uh, concepts. They allow us to have percepts in the first place and to store them and to organize and to retrieve them. Percepts without concepts are blind. Concepts without percepts are empty. Uh, again, if you're a student taking notes here, you sort of will have this in your notes. Kant's view is intended to be a compromise view against those who would pose the question starkly as one of matters of fact versus relations of ideas Hume's fork as if it were a complete dilemma. Hmm? Kant compromises first by conceding the force of the empiricist critique of rationalism. Then he qualifies that critique arguing that even sense experiences require rational form. So does Kant take us all the way back beyond Bacon and Locke to the starting point to Plato? No, he doesn't do that. He does something else. And is he just compromising for the sake of compromise, uh, to make nice? No. Like the surgeon who says, I can't remember, I'm supposed to take off the left leg or the right leg. Well, let me take off a little of each and we will split the difference, right? Um, no, he's not, he's not doing that sort of thing. Kant supersedes his predecessors, but he does so by incorporating them. Hmm? Here's what Kant owes to Bacon and Locke. Uh, Kant's compromise is sometimes called a logico-empiricist view. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, it's one dictated by mutual dependence. When he says concepts without percepts are empty, Kant's accepting the force of the empiricist critique of rationalism, and he goes further. Bacon only says that uh, substantive claims like Aristotle were mistaken. Empty is worse than mistaken. Kant says perceptless concepts would amount to nothing. Here's what Kant owes to Plato and Descartes. Um, by asserting that percepts without concepts are blind, Kant accepts the psychological force of Plato without the, the, the metaphysical baggage, and he does so against the empiricist claim of Locke that there's nothing in the mind. It's not first thing that says it's because Kant thinks that there is something in the mind, something very precise in the mind, as a precondition for having sense experiences in the first place. And so Locke can't be right that the mind is just a passive blank slate. There has to be something in there. So Blindness or emptiness, why choose? It's a false dilemma. Uh, the rationalists are correct, percepts without concepts are blind. The empiricists are correct, concepts without percepts are empty. Why would we want to be blind or empty? Hmm? The rationalists are right, there must be something in the mind in order to have sense experience, but the empiricists are right too. Concepts must be concepts of something, ultimately sensory. Um, well, I'm getting a little ahead there. Ever heard anybody say, well, this may be fine in theory, but it won't work in practice. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, we all know such people. They were around in Kant's world too. Uh, it was a false dilemma then. It's a false dilemma now. Kant thought this was just stupid to say something like this. It's utter rot. Anybody who says this doesn't understand what theory is or what practice is. Theory isn't just unfounded, woolly-headed speculation. Practice isn't just blind activity. It's always activity guided by certain goals, certain insights, certain wants and desires, and so forth. Um, for Bacon and Locke, empiricism was only bottom-up. Ideas were not prior to sense experience. Kant thinks that empiricism is also top-down, both end. There is something in the mind, not first in the senses. And those are what Kant calls categories. Mm -hmm. um, now, categories are not substantive ideas. We're not born knowing a language, for example. We're not born with ideas about mountains, rivers, etc. Locke is perfectly right there. On the other hand, Kant doesn't take us back to Plato, Descartes, and innate ideas. Categories. Um, 
this is a good uh, cartoon summary of Kant. I won't go into uh, 12 categories. I won't go into uh, all of them, what they are. Um, but uh, let's just think of Kant's thinking cap here. Um, anything which is a possible object of experience has as its attributes one or more of these 12 categories, uh, usually more than one, uh, but never all of them uh, simultaneously. Insofar as anything might not correspond to one of the categories, any one of the categories, then it's not a possible object of experience. So our minds are, our minds have an architecture, basically. Um, this is an architectonic view, as it's sometimes called. And, um, and th that structures in advance the kinds of things which will and will not count as knowledge. Categories are means to organize substantive ideas. They're not themselves substantive ideas. They're templates, if you will. Um, interesting commentary on, on Kant. Uh, Kant rejects the claim that there are complete propositions etched on the fabric of the mind. The mind is devoid of content until interaction with the world actuates these formal constraints. The mind possesses a priori templates for judgments, not a priori judgments, but they are indeed formal constraints. Um, and this, you know, this is, is in accord with a lot of what neuroscientists are telling us also about the brain, uh, Kant's coming into his own in our time, in a way that he didn't in his own time. A good example of Kant, what Kant was getting at is this notion of, of categories, uh, with this notion of categories, is the idea of causation. We cannot think without the idea of cause and effect. Remember, Hume took this up, uh, going back to that. Uh, but we do think with the idea of causation. Um, we cannot justify it as something we observe and experience. This is what uh, Hume found, but, but uh, where, where Hume found a lemon, Kant tries to make lemonade. Categories work, think about an old pigeonhole desk or maybe a mailbox, you know, where people get their mail in these little slots, uh, a, a, a space into which things can be classified. It's a classification scheme. Unlike Locke's tabula rasa, the completely blank slate, uh, Kant's categories are not passive receptors. They have to exercise the active faculty of judgment. Uh, categories must be applied to the perception of phenomena. It's simply with, that without these prior categories, perceptions would not be possible in the first place. So Kant had specific ideas about what his categories are. We don't have to go into them. We don't have to share his specific ideas in order to get his very, very general point. And that's threefold. First of all, in order to have any possible sense experience at all, we need categories. Uh, experiences are transitive. They are experiences of something, just like belief is transitive. You have to believe in something. You can't just have belief. You can't just have experience. It's an experience of. Hmm? And you only know it's an experience of to the extent that you have a classification scheme. Suppose, secondly, we get information from sense percepts, as the rationalist tradition tells us, but we have to then have some place to store it. And once we've stored our knowledge, we need to have a way to retrieve it. Categories do all three of these things. Let's start with storage and retrieval. Think about a library, okay? Library is a collection of information, but we have a retrieval system. We have either the Dewey Decimal System, Library of Congress, they work equally well. If we didn't have that, how else could we store books in a library? Well, we could put them in, on shelves by size, the big ones on one end, the small ones on the other end. Or we could organize them by color, the blue books here, the red books there, the green books there. We could organize them by date of acquisition or date of publication. You know, so the earliest ones at the beginning of the queue and the most recent ones at the end. But, but none of these would really work. I mean, imagine you're, you're a, f a sophomore looking for a book for a term paper, you can't find it in senior year, you, oh, here it is. This is the one I needed two years ago. You, you'll never find anything. Um, one of my guilty pleasures now is Amazon.com. And I used to spend a lot of time in brick and mortar bookstores and I spend a less, less time there because Amazon is just so efficient. But here's a big exception. Every time I go to Manhattan, I'm definitely gonna spend some time in the Strand Bookshop. Um, 18 miles of books, really. And here's the checkout counter at the Strand. They did this, it's kind of a joke. They arranged all their books by color. Um, obviously, that wouldn't work. Now on to number one, how we have experiences in the first place. Okay, there's a story in Winnie the Pooh. It's winter. Winnie the Pooh's walking around a tree, his eyes to the ground, and Piglet comes up to, what are you doing? Shh, shh, shh. I'm tracking something. He keeps walking around. Well, what are you tracking? I don't know, but I'll know when I find it. What's he tracking? What tracks are, is he following? Hmm. His own tracks, obviously, he has no idea. If you don't start with a prior idea of the general sort of thing which you're looking, how are you going to ever know when you find it? This is Kant's point. Without categories, experience is not just going to interpret itself. 
you need to know what kind of thing you might be tracking to know if and when you found it. And of course, if you had that much knowledge, it would, Winnie the Pooh would have stopped tracking himself. Uh, Roger Scruton, um, interesting book on Kant. Uh, Roger Scruton's kind of a, a contrarian uh, philosopher, but, but worth reading. Um, it's well for Hume to assert that our knowledge has its foundation in experience, but experience is not the simple concept that Hume supposed it to be. Experience contains intellectual structure. That's exactly what Kant is saying vis-a-vis -vis Hume. So uh, Kant's going to drive a wedge between some of Locke's empiricist theses, but not all of them. Winnie the Pooh is having a sense experience, not just an hallucination. He is seeing something. Okay, there is an experience going on there, but he has no idea what's happening. Uh, he knows he sees the tracks. He has no idea what they are because he doesn't have the appropriate category, Kantian category. Experience is not interpreting itself to him. And as a general point, this is true. Sense experience, for example, the things that we see through a visual system, not self-interpreting. Take a look at this. What do you see here? Well, most people see either a duck or a rabbit. Um, those are the two modal interpretations. You can see you know, the duck's got his bill up there that way, or the rabbit's got his ears up the other way. You know, and it's um, it's just a line. Smart ass students sometimes say, "Well, I just see two lines." Okay, fine. But most people, you know, particularly once the idea is put in their heads, they see it. Maybe first as a rabbit, says somebody says, "No, it's a duck." Oh yeah, I can see there's a duck. There are a number of things that you might see it as. Some people. Um, see it as a wrench, for example. Uh, some people see it as a hairdryer. Believe it or not, I know what a hairdryer is. I used to have one. Um, but, you know, there are many things that people have not told me over the years. Uh, nobody's ever seen that as a Mack truck. Nobody has ever seen that as a cheeseburger. Nobody's ever seen that as their mother-in-law. Uh, there are many things which uh, you cannot uh, see the duck rabbit as. Some people say, you know, it's, it's this thing. By the way, um, be very careful what you do with your hands if you travel to other countries. What does this mean in America? Well, uh, it means okay, but in some countries it means something obscene. You could get beaten up or worse for doing that. In France, what this means is zero. Um, so um, George W. Bush, he likes to do this with his hands. And uh, the day uh, that he gave the State of the Union address announcing the invasion of Iraq, Front page of the LA Times, there's George W. Bush doing this. Uh, I, just, I know in Paris, they're laughing their asses off. Uh, and then I look at the cut line on the photo, when it's Agence France Presse. They, they knew he was going to do this, and they lined up the photo just to catch him doing that. Because in France, this means zero. So if I do this, you know, look at the other person, I'm saying, hey, you know, she's a zero. She's got no game, you know, nullity. I got no weapons of mass destruction. Um, here's a hip tip. If you go to Germany to Oktoberfest uh, in München, uh, my old hometown, um, it's very noisy. So you want to order a beer, you have to use your hands. Now, um, if you want one beer, you look at the waitress and you go, Eins. okay, she brings you a beer. You want two beers, you go, zwei. Uh, you want three, you go, drei. Uh, however many, she brings you the beers. Oh, we're halfway across the room. A lot of Americans go to Oktoberfest and they go, one, want one beer. They don't get a beer. They see the waitress again, they go, they don't get all night. They sit at Oktoberfest. They do not get a beer to drink. Why? Because in German sign language, German body language, this means warten Sie, wait. So you see, when you go to Oktoberfest now, you know what to do. Who ever said you never learned anything useful in a philosophy class? It's just not true. Hmm. So here is the famous, it's my rendition of the famous Wittgenstein duck rabbit. Um, and um, it's one of a number of visual illusions that illustrate how visual objects, even ordinary simple ones, are far from self-interpreting. Uh, the mind is actively interpreting, it's judging as Kant says, and it's doing so in terms of prior categories uh, which, uh, in which the thing can be apprehended in the first place, stored as knowledge or treated as knowledge. Plato's point, the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Rather, the mind sees actively and it sees by noticing. And I'm just gonna run through this real quickly and you can come back to it if you want or pause it if you want. Um, in order to apprehend and make sense of these visual stimuli, the duck rabbit or the Necker cube or the, 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 uh, the, the boring uh, old lady, young lady, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, one has to actively notice a duck or a rabbit. Notice that one face or another of the cube looks closer. Notice that there is a young woman or an old one. But noticing implies that there are categories in the first place by which to do the noticing. 
So Kant offers a version of empiricism. It's empiricism corrected by paying attention to the action of prior mental categories. Bacon stated empiricism 101 as a philosophy of science. Uh, its vision of science was one in which matters of fact were observed and only thereafter relations of ideas arose. Locke's empiricism 102 uh, reinforced this program with his assertion that ideas are only posterior to experience or to matters of fact never prior to it. It's possible, however, to give counterexamples of cognition, which positively, uh, which depends, cognition, which depends positively on ideas prior to experience. We could even do this with respect to science itself. And if you think about, you know, when you first saw that duck rabbit, whatever that was, um, you probably tested some alternative hypothesis, uh, hypotheses. Is it a duck? Yeah, I can see it that way. Is it a rabbit? I can see it that way. Is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? Or you had one hypothesis, it's a duck, and somebody suggested to you, no, it's a rabbit, and you entertained that idea, and you said, oh, yeah, now I can see it by means of that idea. Neither rabbit nor duck is disclosing itself to you on any kind of locky and blank slate, but rather you're going back and forth noticing and testing hypotheses in, in a very active manner. To see the figure as a duck, you have to first be duck-minded toward it. And to see the figure as a rabbit, you also have to be actively rabbit-minded toward it. You have to be active toward it, and you have to have a template uh, by which to see it. Um, these are things which are in the mind, not first of the senses. Here's a perfectly good example of that. Somebody did this duck-rabbit thing in the Zurich Zoo. And around Easter time, children coming into the zoo were much more likely to see that thing as a rabbit because they're thinking about the Easter bunny they're rabbit minded around Easter time and in October, much more likely to see it as a duck. Um, their ideas uh, tend to change. Imagine you were a Martian and you looked at this figure. Now humans would say, I'm duck minded, I see it as a duck, I'm rabbit minded, I see it as a rabbit. I'm assuming that there aren't ducks and rabbits on Mars. A Martian seeing this for the first time probably would have no clue, would have neither idea or maybe this resembles something that a Martian knows that we don't, and they would see it that way too. In any case, absent, oops, absent uh, the mental set, the perceptual set, the mental category, whatever you want to call it, because it's all the same thing, really. Um, you, absent that, you would not see it. And here's, of course, the famous old lady, young lady, works the same way. The trick is the old lady's face is bigger, so her nose is, uh, you know, uh, right kind of in the middle toward the bottom. That's the young lady's cheek. The young lady's face is turned sideways. The old lady's facing uh, you know, uh, almost forward. And um, the, they're both wearing babushkas. The one for the old lady is pulled more tightly over her big head. The one for the young lady is flowing out and so forth. And you can play with that. Yeah, this may not be the best drawing. There are other attempts to draw the old lady, young lady. But if you want to play with it, it's, it's a fairly common illusion. It goes back to the 19th century. Very very much a staple in um, experimental perceptual psychology associated with uh, E.G. Boring. That was actually his name. I'm told that he was not boring, but that was his name. Uh, it's a little more complicated than the duck rabbit, but uh, the same point. So Kant's point, in order to have the sense experience of vision in the first place, we need actively to notice and we need to do so by means of categories. And those categories are prior to our perception, something in the mind before they're in the senses. Um, this point applies to ordinary sense perception by the same token. It applies to sense perception exercised in science as well. This is what the Baconian Lockean version of empiricism misses. So scientists, what kind of birds are they? Are they more like magpies or are they more like blue jays? A magpie is an indiscriminate gatherer. Um, if you're washing dishes, do not take your wedding ring off and put it on the kitchen table with the window open. The magpie flies in and they like pretty shiny things. The magpie will grab that, take it to its nest, it's gone. You'll never see it again. They don't care. They grab everything pretty and shiny. They just collect, 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 collect. Now, on uh, the Bacon Lock view, this is basically what scientists do. Remember what Darwin said, I went out and gathered facts on a wholesale scale without respect to any theory or other body of ideas. Hmm? But not all birds are like magpies. Jays are um, also hunters and, 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 and gatherers, uh, but they operate by means of search images. Now, um, and there's some interesting experimentation about cognition. We wouldn't call it thinking, perhaps we could call it think cognition. Um, it's visual, it's cognitive. We wouldn't want to go so far as to call it thinking, perhaps, but jays carry a mental set of cognitive expectations not necessarily ideas in every sense. This helps them to do what they need to do, which is to eat. And what they eat is yuck moths. Okay, so 
finding a moth, because moths use camouflage, is a matter of crypticities. That is, can moths successfully hide themselves uh, cryptically, or can they not do that? Can they fail to do that and then be caught out by uh, eagle eye or eagle eye, <laughs> a blue jay? A blue jay. Um, here's, here's, here's an experimental pattern. Uh, different levels of crypticity numbered, so level zero shows the moths all by themselves on a gray background. Foreground is pretty clear. Uh, if you introduce a, 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 a motley background, um, again, with the same moths, you can kind of see them at level two, I can, and I can kind of see them at level four, but by level six, I'm defeated. I cannot see where the moths are uh, in the foreground on that background pattern labeled number six. Well, jays can do it. Um, that's how they eat. They are, are able to detect those moths even on high levels of crypticity. They're able to sort out background from foreground. If you've seen this kind of thing before, it's the same thing, gestalt psychology, uh, typical research tool. Do you see two faces or a vase? Well, you can see either alternating, probably not both of them at once. Um, it's a background, foreground problem. Which, which part is your mind going to actively notice as the foreground? Which part is it going to notice as the background? The jays are doing exactly the same thing when they catch moths. Um, the gestalt functions psychologically in the same way as Kant's categories do. In fact, it was influenced by that idea. Um, prior pattern used actively to produce sense experience in the mind, not first in the senses, contrary to what Locke says. So what are scientists like? Are they hunters and gatherers uh, like uh, magpies or are they hunters and gatherers like blue jays hmm? with search images? Let's look at fossil hunting as an example. This illustrates Kant's point about search images, background and foreground. Fossil evidence is kind of camouflaged. You see a bunch of oatmeal colored bones on an oatmeal colored uh, ground. And a paleontologist who's gonna hunt fossils successfully needs to have a search image, needs to have a general kind of idea of what they're looking for in order to spot these things in the terrain uh, which they search. Paleontologists are like blue jays here. They employ search images. You can call them metal sets. You can call them gestalts. You can call them visual expectations. You can call it fossil mindedness like duck riders or you like they're all the same thing really. But contrary to what Locke says, these are things which are first in the minds, not first in the senses, okay? And paleontologists do this as Kant would say in order to have the relevant sense experiences in the first place. I don't like to read slides to you, but this one's a little, uh, prints a little small. Uh, this is Richard Leakey, who is a notable fossil hunter. Um, uh, he comments on this in the following way. A fossil hunter says that he needs sharp eyes and a keen search image, a mental template that conscious, subconsciously evaluates everything he sees in his search for telltale clues. A kind of mental radar works even if he isn't concentrating hard. A fossil mollusk expert has a mollusk search image. A fossil antelope expert has an antelope search image. Yet, even when one has a good internal radar, the search is incredibly more difficult than it sounds. Uh, not only are fossils often the same color as the rocks among which they are found, so they blend in with the background, they are also usually broken into odd shaped fragments. In our business, we don't expect to find a whole skull hanging on the surface staring up at us. The typical find is a small piece of petrified bone. The fossil hunter's search therefore has to have an infinite number of dimensions matching every conceivable angle of every shape or fragment of every bone of the human body. What Leakey is saying, I think, is that a fossil hunting empiricist is more like a blue jay, less like a magpie. Hmm? How do you see fossils? Well, the landscape of East Africa, and that's where we hunt fossils now, is dry chaparral, what they, what they call garig in the Mediterranean. It's rather like what we have here in Southern uh, California. Incidentally, it took us a while to work that out. Um, has anyone ever hear, heard of Piltdown Man? Piltdown Man uh, was a famous fossil a little more than a century ago, 1912, found in a quarry in Piltdown in Sussex, named south of England, southeast of England. Um, and uh, it turns out later it was a forgery. Um, it was supposed to be an ancestor of human beings. Well, the curious thing, most curious thing about Piltdown Man now is why was anybody looking in southern England? because that's not where early humans originated. Well, that was, you know, it's kind of like the guy looking for his lost nickel under the light. Did you lose it here under the light? No, but here's where the light is, so I'm looking here. Um, the Leakey's, the Leakey family in particular uh, got us to sort this out. Uh, Africa's where it's at. Africa's where human beings originated and our ancestors, and it's there that you'll find their remains to study. So every year they have, in, in, in East Africa, like we do in Los Angeles here, rainy season, 
uh, fossils wash down the gathering season in the summer uh, goes there when it's drier and they pick out these uh, fragments and they try to piece them together in these fossil rich areas. And here's the kind of thing that they're going to get. They're going to get little fragments, like he says. They're going to have to have their radar operating in order to find them in the first place, and they're not going to find the whole thing. Have you ever played the game Where's Waldo? Well, that's, that is the same kind of figure ground problem that Leakey's describing for fossil hunters. You have a search image, you know what Waldo looks like, you know the kind of thing you're looking for, but boy, he's got a red and white striped shirt. There are lots of red and white stripes, there are lots of red things, blue things. Boy, it's going to take a while, and there are going to be a lot of things that you don't notice. Anybody notice, by the way, there are no shadows in this picture of the beach? Well, there be, and no shadows. Well, okay, you usually don't notice that. But if you look long and hard, you're going to find, yeah, Waldo is there. There he is, right in the middle toward the top. Mm -hmm. um, hidden in plain sight. Um, you need to foreground Waldo from the background that's similar to Waldo. Uh, you need a search image to do this. It can be done, but it takes some work. And all these things are true of what fossil hunting scientists do as well. Here's another example. Take a look at this. What do you see here? Oh. Okay. Does anybody see the dolphins? No dolphins. Most adults don't. Children younger than nine, though, typically see the dolphins. You can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine dolphins in there. Um, yeah, once the category, uh, the idea of the search image of dolphins is suggested, then we too are able to see the dolphins. But our uh, customary search image, I guess, is the man and woman naked. Uh, that's what we go for first. But, but young children haven't picked up that search image presumably yet. Um, here's another example. Six and nine, kind of similar. Where do you find, how do you foreground six? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, Zero and or letter O and letter C, let's say, uh, very similar. Where do you find? Oh, there it is. Okay. Letters M and N, that's even more difficult, much more similar to one another. Where, oh, there it is. Okay. So, yes, we can do this, uh, even if, uh, if it's hard. As long as we have a search image, if we know what an N looks like as opposed to an M, we can go test hypotheses and, and our radar can tell us eventually it may take some time. Now, this ability is not innate. Um, it is learned, but not necessarily learned in sort of textbook fashion. It turns out there are two kinds of people who are particularly good at spotting fossils. One kind is, is rapidly disappearing. Older Englishmen of a certain generation, those who grew up as children during the Blitz in the Second World War. Um, the Nazis bombed, uh, bombed London, completely, almost completely obliterated the city of London, and um, uh, actually, uh, Churchill started it bombing Hitler first, Hitler returned the compliment, but it was horrendous. And every night, uh, families would go down into the tubes, the subway system, and uh, they would use those as bomb shelters. Take the kids down quick, because the kids got bored, so parents would take puzzles and games. Well, after a while, a kid doing a picture puzzle, you know, gets to know the puzzle and they get bored with that. So the parents would make the kids do the picture puzzle upside down, that is, without the picture showing just the shapes. That's a little more challenging. That keeps them busier, longer. And it turns out that some kids that got good at doing that during the Blitz also became good at finding oatmeal colored fragments uh, in an oatmeal colored uh, landscape, uh, just as they would an oatmeal colored puzzle in the tube uh, during the war. Uh, the second group of guys that's good at doing this are guys that have grown up in the region. I would not be very good. I I still, as I've lived in California more than half my life now, and I still have not gotten used to the fact that it only rains for a little while in the year and that there are things called rivers that don't have water in them most of the year and, and that the landscape is green for a couple of months and then brown most of the year. But, you know, if you're used to that kind of terrain, you may see things a little differently than a foreigner like me will see. And here's a guy, Kamoyo Kameo, found more fossils, how many fossils than any single person. He's a local guy. And he got some training when they first hired him. Uh, they told him he was going to dig. He thought he was going to have to dig ditches. But they, you know, introduced him to a bit of paleontology. He picked up the relevant search images and uh, he went to town. Uh, and he turned out to do very, very well at using these search images, uh, using his radar to find fossils. So the consideration of search images reveals how categories, concepts, ideas, cognitive expectations, gestalts, metal sets, all the same thing actually do work in scientific research by allowing us to notice what we see. We are much more like those blue jays and the moths 
in order to put together a skull from fragments that looks like this, that we are like those magpies. And this bears out what Popper says about philosophy of science, uh, namely, if scientific theory is not an induction bottom-up whereby reality discloses itself directly through the senses, rather scientific theory is prior and generates top-down hypotheses which then are tested against empirical evidence, which are then rejected or not rejected according as they correspond or do not to the evidence. And that's again something we we'll hold that thought. We'll come back to that again in the third problem when we talk about uh, the goals of our knowledge. Talk about Popper in some detail. Um, so this far, we have considered Kant's critique of the rationalism and empiricism debate. Kant suggests that Locke's extreme insistence, nothing in the mind which is not first of the census isn't gonna work for us. There must be some things, categorized as he calls them, metal sets, whatever, which are in fact first in the mind before allowing us to use our senses to make observations. And we've seen that even in the case of science, the exemplary form of human knowledge, uh, which is what the empiricist movement set out to preserve and reform, even in science, observation requires categories. Paleontologists using their search image to foreground fossil data are more like blue jays, less like magpies than the bacon lock tradition would have us believe. So from Kant's point of view, the standard statement of empiricism, empiricism 101, 102, has to be regarded as an inadequate statement of empiricism. But the thing to recognize about Kant is that he wants to give a better one. Uh, if we look at what's happening in neurobiology and cognitive science and artificial intelligence, etc., uh, we see th that there are more reasons today to think the mind acts more or less as Kant told us that it did from the 18th century than we've had hitherto. Um, you know, the empiricist tradition says we use our senses, we soak up things like a sponge from the sensory input, which comes in to the brain from the outside. Matters of fact give rise to relations of ideas. But if all we had was sensory input to the brain, this could be very confusing, overwhelming, like a bad acid trip. Like a blooming, buzzing confusion, as we in terms uh, would expect. Enough of that, that's painful. But what we discover is that the brain acts so as to reduce what otherwise would be unmanageable complexity of sensory input. Vision, for example, vision works by means of what's called a continuity field. Okay, so you're standing in a, uh, a train station watching all the people go by, you know, the Victoria Station or, or Grand Central Station in New York. Um, it's impossible to focus equally on each and every detail of the visual field at all times. So if you look at that woman in the middle, then you've got to ignore the other guys rushing by. You have to pick and choose. Because it's impossible to take in visually every little detail from the senses, the brain constructs a background image and it refreshes this about every 15 seconds. So we foreground certain details and background some other details. This is Fisher and Whitney, uh, classic uh, piece of research. Um, and we, we refresh a uh, constructed background. This allows us to foreground one at a time objects we want to focus on. Kenneth Burke told us this a long time ago. Every way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. That is, well, I don't have my glasses here now, but I could look through my glasses and see, or I could look at my glasses, but then I'm not looking through them and not using them. A famous story in the 1950s, uh, when I was, uh, I was up there at this time in Seattle and in Tacoma, where I was born in Fort Lewis, Washington, now Joy Bay, Lewis McCord, there was the great Seattle windshield pitting epidemic. People were worried about fallout. We were still at this point testing nuclear weapons above ground that stopped in the 1960s, but this is the 50s. Um, and there was this worry about something called fallout that might be blowing across the Pacific and drifting over to North America. And the rumor got started that yes, it was coming and it was pitting windshields and people went out and they looked at the car windshields and oh my God, there's, there's pits in my windshield. It's the fallout, it's coming for us. This great hysteria. The governor called out the National Guard. It all blew over in a couple of weeks. And, and subsequently, about a decade later, some sociologists going through old newspapers from that period that had discovered uh, this mass hysteria and, and came to uh, come look for an explanation of it. Well, if you go out and look at your windshield right now, you will see there are pits in your windshield. It's ordinary road damage, you know, pieces of gravel. Do, but normally, do you ever look at your windshield? No, you look through your windshield. You get in your car, you crank it up, you look through, there you go. You're not focusing on the windshield. So that every way of seeing is also a not seeing. Seeing through your windshield means you're not seeing your windshield. Uh, seeing through my eyeglasses means I'm not seeing the eyeglasses. We focus, we select. 
sensation cannot be total, cannot be 100% accurate either. Sacrifices and trade-offs are going to be made. And David Whitney, one of the researchers I just uh, mentioned, um, remarks in this way, the continuity field pulls together, he says, physically but not radically different objects who appear more similar to each other. This is surprising because it means the visual system sacrifices accuracy for the sake of the continuous stable perception of objects. So our visual system is constructed in such a way not to give us 100% clear and distinct ideas. Hmm? And so far from being just the tabula rasa of John Locke, the brain is actively constructing interpretations of visual sensory inputs, selecting uh, what's, what it's going to foreground and pay attention to, what it's going to background and not pay attention to. Predictive processing. Um, Andy Clark and his research. Um, backgrounding goes top down from prior expectations, which predict foreground attention takes over when predictable expectations are violated. Um, perception, says Clark, is in a way a brain generated hallucination. One influenced by reality, but an hallucination nonetheless, that is, it's a two way street. The mind is actively adding something to the perceptual process, even if we say that the senses are giving us something in the perceptual process as well. Perception of the external world is a brain generated hallucination. This is what seems to happen with continuity fields. It seems to happen with predictive processing. Um, sensory perceptions are top down hallucinations, but reality tested hallucinations. And this sounds again rather like what Karl Popper says about scientific hypotheses. Again, defer that discussion till a little bit later. Predictive processing accounts for not only what we notice, but also for what we don't notice. There's a phenomenon psychologists call inattentional blindness, okay? Inattentional blindness is a form of psychological blindness, not physical blindness, in which it's possible not to see objects that are right in front of our nose, uh, or not to be aware of objects which are right in front of our nose. You know, Bacon says to us, look in front of your bloody nose, Thomas is Aristotle's teeth, but sometimes we fail at doing that even when it's right in front of our nose. Um, classic experiment, the gorilla in the basketball court, okay? Um, Simons and Chabris experiment. Uh, they take a bunch of students, they give them clipboards, they say, okay, watch this basketball game and take your clipboard and count the number of times that this one team passes the ball to itself. So subjects are watching this basketball game and marking down the passes. And in the middle of all this, a guy in a gorilla suit walks across the basketball court. Okay, this is being filmed. So afterwards, the researchers debrief their subjects and say, okay, and um, what about the gorilla? What, what, what gorilla? Most of them didn't see the gorilla. So they run the film. And they say, oh my God, there's a gorilla there. Yeah, well, they were not paying attention. They were not thinking about a gorilla. They were thinking about other things. So they were backgrounding even something as surprising as a big gorilla walking across a basketball court in favor of foregrounding what they were supposed to be doing. Hmm? Um, this is a kind of a, a frivolous example, a uh, more serious example. Pilots. Um, often do not see obstacles in their approach path, okay? They're landing the plane, they're watching the wing level, they're watching the altimeter, they're watching the airspeed. They don't see right in front of them, there's an aircraft in the glide path and they're going to hit it. So this is why pilots are periodically trained on flights, re refreshed on flight simulators because you're not gonna do real damage. And you know they train themselves to catch these sorts of things. They train themselves to pay attention, whereas otherwise they would be psychologically blind by inattention. Why do so many motorcycles get hit by, um, uh, by automobile drivers? Well, because they, in some sense, don't see the motorcycle. They're not watching for motorcycles, you know? And I know, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'm going down a highway and it's, and here's this motorcycle that's passing on the side. Now, I might very well have made a turn without looking uh, and I would have killed that guy, right? Um, I, I don't, I, make my, I try to make myself more aware of it, but I could easily be driving down the road and people with, with good driving skills could do this all the time. And just you don't see, psychologically don't see the motorcyclist even though he's right there. Movie bloopers are another example of this. Um, pretty woman, um, she's eating a croissant and all of a sudden it changes to a pancake. Well, because they stopped filming, cut, and then it came back and pieced it together on the cutting room floor, but somebody gave her the different prop. And, you know, normally we don't notice this. There, there are people that, that, you know, that do this and there are all kinds of videos on YouTube about movie bloopers, but you have to be movie blooper minded. You have to watch the movie with an eye toward, you know, Harry Potter. <clears throat> he goes to bed <clears throat> with a crew neck shirt and wakes up with a Henley shirt. Well, somebody said cut and they pieced this together. These were two separate scenes that we see as one, uh, but we don't notice the, the discontinuity because we're looking at the continuity. Harry goes to bed, Harry wakes up. That's what we're after. 
Here is an interesting object, <clears throat> The Impossible Prongs by Roger Penrose. It just gets worse. Um, there are visual illusions about objects of which we might in fact have sense experience, but we can't, okay? If you look at this, just look at half of it, it makes sense. Um, you could go to a hardware store and get, let's say, three dowel rods and make the left-hand side. You could go to the same hardware store and get a couple pieces of uh, one by, or two by two, let's say, and uh, make the other bit. But the whole thing together, hmm. Um, I don't say this lightly because I don't give my students my grades, they earn them, but I said at one point, you know, if anybody can build one of these, uh, bring it to class next week, because one once a week class, and you, you don't have to take the final, you don't have to take the, the, the midterm, you get an A for the class. Oh, I can do it, I can do it, said one guy. Okay, sir. Sure. So next Wednesday rolls around. Did you? Bring the object. I'm still working on it, still working on it. Well, <clears throat> he sat the midterm and the final with the rest of the class. No, this is an impossible object. Now, here's the thing. I can't touch this object. I can't build this in three dimensions, but I can visualize it. Now, if Locke is correct that there is nothing in the mind, not first of the senses, well, the only way this object could have gotten into my visual system, into my mind, is I must have seen it or touched it or had some kind of visual sensual or some kind of sensual experience of this object, but I couldn't have because it's not a possible object in three dimensions. Here's an even more complicated one. Um, uh, Moritz Konevis Kone Escher, a 20th century artist. Let's see what's going on here. You've got a waterfall and it's turning a mill wheel. Uh, we don't know what's going on inside the mill. It could be grinding corn, it could be producing electricity, whatever. Then the water, which turns the wheel, flows down the channel, goes down and you see the courses of blocks going down. It goes so far down, it comes back up again and then turns the wheel all over again. This is a picture of a perpetual motion machine. It's a machine that puts out infinite output with no further input of energy into the system. Physicists tell us this is impossible to do. This is impossible to build. And yet we can see it. What's going on here? If Locke was right, if there's nothing in the mind, not first of the senses, how could we even see that? Well, it must be false that there is nothing in the mind, not first of the senses. If that is false, Kant at least gives us an alternative way of dealing with such matters. Okay. Have we settled the rationalist empiricist controversy? Well, one of the characteristics of philosophy is aporia. And we're gonna see this as we begin to read the Platonic dialogues. Socrates asks a question, they go through a long discussion. Do they get an answer to the question at the end? No, they don't. It's still open-ended, it's still up for grabs. It's aporetic, it's unsettled. This is typical of philosophy. Um, Alfred North Whitehead famously, a science which hesitates to forget its founders is lost. Science is a progressive enterprise. It solves problems. Uh, philosophy is still dealing in many cases with the same problems we began with 2,600 years ago. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I said um, you can't do philosophy without understanding the history of philosophy. But if Whitehead is right, you shouldn't and can't do science starting with the history of science. You want to be on the cutting edge. You need to forget what went before because so much is happening that's new. You're going to miss it. With philosophy, it's a little different. Um, Bernie Russell says, science is what we know, philosophy is what we don't know. Um, and maybe this is because philosophy is dimmer. Um, another view is that philosophy makes so little progress because philosophy gave the easy questions to the sciences. So you want to know about the uh, motions of the planets. It's tough to work out, but you can work it out. You want to know why there is something rather than nothing. Well, that's going to take some more time to work out the problems that the philosophers retained once philosophy became P2, just that one discipline among all others, uh, in some ways are tougher problems than the problems of physics, or the problems of physics are not easy. Notice how long a run rationalism had. Uh, Baconian empiricism, much shorter run, Kant's compromise, logical empiricism compromise even shorter. Um, and um, uh, you know we've had some time to play with them, but have we settled them? Well, Empiricism has one ground today insofar as nobody believes, no single person believes what Plato believed or what Descartes believed about innate ideas. It's just not a, not a starter anymore. Um, science is no longer content with the Aristotelian ideas of the mind, with usury, with you know women having fewer teeth, all that kind of stuff. Bacon won out, science rests solidly on the foundation of observation. On the other hand, nobody holds the strict empiricism of somebody like Bacon or Locke today, which the mind is a blank slate. Reality discloses itself 
uh, through simple sense observation. Uh, the relations of ideas are just inductions, simple inductions for matters of fact. So does this mean that empiricism has been abandoned? I would want to argue no. Kant's compromise is described as the logical empirical view because Kant, and rightly so, because Kant wants to upgrade, not to abandon or abolish the empiricist project. He wants to salvage empiricism by correcting the deficient view that the mind is a passive blank receptor in the process of perception in favor of his view that the mind employs prior mental sets and it actively seeks and processes experience. So if we think of a pendulum, Plato gave us one extreme rationalism, Locke countered with another extreme. Kant dialed it back, not all the way back, but swing it back just a little bit, corrected empiricism by adding some rationalist elements to it. And so what Kant really gives us from this point of view is empiricism 2.0, and Locke gave us empiricism 1.0. Um, the major reason philosophy is so widely taught in modern higher education is a concern that as a part of liberal education, students have the opportunity to, cult to cultivate something called critical thinking. What a curious idea that is. Think critically, you know? Think of working for the Creativity Corporation and your boss tells you to go back to your cubicle and start thinking outside the box. I order you. Well, perhaps it's better to think critically than to think uncritically. Um, don't believe everything you think, as Maxine tells us. Uh, but you know, the, the gullibility comes in several flavors. There's the gullibility that believes everything. There's the gullibility also, as Cynthia Ozick tells us, which disbelieves everything. If you've been on the internet recently, uh, perhaps you've seen some of that. There's even a body of thought known as critical theory. Uh, the idea in, in the social sciences and literary criticism that, that uh, thinking was uncritical by default until uh, the last couple of decades. And we've made now a special effort to make it critical. I think Daly, Socrates, Plato, Descartes, Bacon, Locke, Bacon, Locke, Kant, Marx, Hegel, and Popper might have been very puzzled by the idea that critical thinking has gone missing all along and needs to be injected at a later date. I think if we look at the rationalist empiricist controversy, we see this as a debate over how we should be critical and how we should avoid gullibility, not uh, that we don't need to think about such questions. Um, the whole history of philosophy, it seems to me, has, has been a history of critical thought, of trying to root out false consciousness and trying to winnow out what's true from what is false. Um, so we've seen some of that uh, as we've looked at the question of rationalism versus empiricism. I hope you have some insight now into that. And we can go on then to our second problem, uh, the distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions. And I have to say, the next two problems are gonna be a little bit shorter than the rationalism Empiricism, empiricism was. So thank you and good day and I will see you next time. <laughs>